In this video, you'll hear from lead data scientist at Cape Analytics, Giacomo Vianello, in a clip from RMDS Labs 2020 I'm Data Conference. You'll learn about how to assess and address bias and variance in your data, specifically looking at geospatial data. By the end of this video, you'll have some recommendations and strategies for dealing with variance and dealing with bias. Something more serious, uh, once you are starting collecting ground truth, you have to have a good handle on the quality of the ground truth. And you can think about, uh, in particular, bias and variance. So let's take a classification example. This is a classification example with seven classes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And you can be in, the, in uh, one of these four situations. In the upper left, you are in the low bias, low variance situation. So you have a fairly easy task, which means if you collect multiple votes for the same items from different workers, uh, all these votes are more or less the same and they are on the right class. The right class is, um, is um, um, the red line, is marked by the red line. So here, every, almost every worker voted the same and they, were, they voted on the right thing. So this is characteristic of a fairly easy task and a well understood task. But you can also be in the upper right where you have low bias but high variance. So now this is a much harder task. So you get the distribution of votes. Uh, and so the votes from your workers are dispersed. But if you collect enough of them, the distribution is centered on the right answer. So this is a high variance, low bias situation. Unfortunately, you can also be in the lower left, which is high bias, low variance, where all the workers more or less vote for the same, but it's the wrong answer. This is typically when the workers did not understand the task correctly or you didn't uh, explain the task correctly. And then again, you can also be in the lower right, and this is the hardest situation where you have a hard task, so you have a lot of dispersion, and it's also poorly understood. So even if you collect a lot of votes, the distribution is not centered on the right, on the right answer. Now, there are techniques to deal with variance and with bias. Let's look first at the bias. Uh, the first thing that you want to do is you want to collect multiple votes for every item. And here in this plot, you have the consensus score, so the agreements between the workers as a function of the number of votes. And you can see a typical diminishing return situation where uh, at some point collecting more votes does not lead to a big improvement in consensus score. And so you want to be smart about how many votes you collect. Uh, of course, collecting multiple, a lot of votes, it can, can be expensive. And of course, you don't need to collect the same number of votes on every item. Some items are easier than others. And so you can optimize the vote allocation. Another thing that you can do is you can train your model on soft labels instead of hard labels. So instead of feeding to your model the one uh, ground truth, for example, the majority vote, uh, you actually feed it soft labels so that the model learns from the distribution of the votes. And so in particular, it can learn that some examples are harder than others. And so they, they weigh less. Another thing that you can do is you can build actually models for the workers that are going to tell you, are going to predict how the, um, a certain worker will respond to a certain situation. And there are different ways you can go about this. One way you can train worker models as part of your uh, model training, or you can build worker models uh, on the side of your, uh, of your uh, training. So these are some techniques to deal with variance. Now, with bi dealing with biases uh, even harder because uh, there was really no, uh, so bias can also be uh, called systematic error. And in order to reduce that, uh, you need to do these things. First of all, you need to refine your taxonomy, so the definition of your task, so that you collect feedback from the workers and so that uh, they, you eliminate all the misunderstanding that there can be. And then you also need to qualify your workers to certify that they have understood the task. But it's not enough to do this once because some of these uh, ground of campaign that can last for weeks or for months. So you have to keep monitoring your performance so that you avoid drift. And then no matter what you do, you're gonna have some uh, low consensus items that you're gonna need to review uh, manually and to, uh, to figure out what is going on there. Okay, so these are some techniques to deal with bias and variance. Now, uh, let's move to something a little different. So I told you at the beginning that it's very important to keep up with research. And so now I'm gonna uh, talk to you about one recent example uh, about how this can be beneficial. So one characteristic of geospatial data is that you have a lot of unlabeled data available because 
uh, your vendors, the, the vendors that uh, provide you with the aerial images, they collect, uh, they collect uh, data continuously several times a year for every location in the US as well as in the world. And so, for example, at Cape, we have access to an estimate 15 billion property level images. Now, this is a very big data set. It's comparable in size to the total images uploaded to Instagram that is estimated to be 50 billion. And if instead you talk about block level images, the images that I showed you at the beginning dealing with the, the neighborhood, we have access to around 200 million of them. So it's a lot smaller, but it's still a very big data set. And again, to give you kind of a, a comparison, ImageNet is 1.4 million images. And so this is kind of characteristic of geospatial data because in other industries, you actually have to go out and collect this data for yourself. For example, if you think about self-driving cars or other domains like that. Instead here in the geospatial images, you have this very, very big uh, reservoir of unlabeled data. And so of course the question is, how can we exploit this unlabeled data? Uh, the answer is this um, discipline, semi-supervised learning. This discipline has been around for quite a bit but only recently has started to reach uh, a performance level that is actually comparable to the fully supervised settings. And in particular, this uh, technique is very interesting. It's called the noisy student. And it works like this. You start from a labeled data set, a normal labeled data set, and you, do, and you train a model that you call the teacher. And this is just a, set, a standard supervised learning. Then you use this teacher uh, to perform inference on a much larger unlabeled data set just like we did for active learning. And again, as we did for active learning, you select the examples where the, the model, the teacher model is very confident. And now what you do is you use these pseudo labels as well as the original label data as ground truth for a secondary model, which is called the student model. Now the student model needs to be uh, more powerful than the teacher model because it's seeing more data than the teacher model. And also it needs to be uh, noisy. So you need to add uh, drop on stochastic depth or, that, or other stochastic elements. And if you do this, uh, it's demonstrated that the student model is going to perform better than the teacher model. And now what you can do is you can transform the student model into the teacher model and uh, repeat this loop several times to get bigger and better models uh, until you reach your reach limit. So this is very, very in interesting recent techniques that allows you to uh, exploit uh, unlabeled data. Visit grmds.org to hear Giacomo's full talk, Geospatial AI at Scale, Challenges and Innovations. Through the link in the description, you can take advantage of a complimentary premium one-month membership to access all of the talks from IMData 2020 conference, webinars, online courses, data sets, workflow collections, and much more. Visit our data science ecosystem at grmds.org.